Heavenly Father, we come in the precious name of Jesus. We come to exalt you, Jesus, to lift your name up in praise. We come to know you, Father. We come to know you, Jesus. And we're dependent upon you to reveal yourself tonight to us. Whether it be the worship, whether it be the teaching of the word, whether it's in the fellowship, just glorify yourself tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to praise and honor our God. We thank you, Lord, for 
for salvation. We thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, we thank you. With all of my strength, for you are my Lord. You are my Lord, Jesus. You are my God who hears 
the cry of my heart you see every tear you are the god of mercy and grace compassion forgiveness and peace in the secret place of my heart you are the god who sees So I come, I come to the cross and find peace in my weary soul. I come and into your rest, you will make me whole. So I come to the cross to find peace for my weary soul. And I come and enter your rest. You will make me whole. You are the God who sees. My deepest hurt, my every need. You are the God who hears the cry of my heart. You see every tear. You are the God of mercy and grace, compassion, forgiveness, and peace. In the secret place of my heart, you are the God who sees. Oh, I come, I come to the cross and find peace for my weary soul. I come.
the blood of the Lamb. I enter to worship you only. I enter to We wait your coming. 
Yes, Lord, that's our prayer, Lord. We, we want to be more like you, Lord. We want to hear your word. We want to hear you, Lord. 
We thank you and honor and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai, we're going to kind of do an introduction and look at chapter one tonight, and next week we'll look at chapter two. And I've titled the message tonight, God's Exhortation to Build the Temple. Let's open in prayer. Father, we look to you, to your spirit, to bring illumination, illumination to our hearts. Lord, I know I can speak the words, but it's you that open up the hearts. We want to hear from you personally, intimately, Lord. We want to know your way and your will. We want to understand more and more about you. So we ask that you take us deeper, deeper in the understanding of who you are and how you deal with sin. And that you want obedience from your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 through 15. We'll begin with an introduction and then we'll, we'll look at the text. Now, Haggai is this great book that really reveals God's call, that is his call to his people to rebuild the temple. If you remember, they had gone to Babylon. They were there for 70 years. Their return back to the land. And it's a very practical book at the same time that you and I can relate to in many ways. Well, it's great in the fact that it reveals that God's desire is to rebuild the temple. We often forget that our body is the temple of God. And God's, it, it's, it's where our spirit inhabits and it's a temporary thing until he takes us home. But just as great as that book is and that indication, it's a great book that calls us really to practical living. See, oftentimes people want to hear this and that and things that make them feel good. But God's concerned about our character, our direction, our walk. So it, it again, is a book that it speaks and calls us to practical living. First, living for God, a living God. That our life should be, again, surrounded Him and put Him him being preeminent before all things and his work first. Everything starts with God and from their God and, and then the family, the husband and wife and the children and the workplace and all that. But God wants to be first in your life. If he's not first in your life, then you have an idol in your life because something else is going to be first in your life. And Oftentimes it's ourself. Now Haggai, again, is, is one of the 12. And I call it the 12 because it was one book together. And that's what in the, the Hebrew they would call it the 12. It, and we call it the minor prophets. Minor, uh, again, not uh, because of the message. The message is powerful. Just as pertinent and important as, as the big books. But it's length. They're short. They cut to the chase. They deal with the facts. Now both Haggai and Zechariah both ministered at the same period of time. And then again, we have another person, Malachi, which are the last of the 12 prophets. So tonight, uh, we're looking at Haggai. There's two chapters in that. We'll look two weeks. And then we'll look at Zechariah. There's 14 chapters. And then we look at Malachi. And this is bringing us through what we call the minor prophets. Now, the author of these 12, again, affirmed God's amazing love for Israel. They were the apple of his eye. And by the way, you are God's apple of his eye as well. But it also, it reveals the horrific sin of the people. A lot of people say, well, don't preach at me. I don't want to hear about sin. And the moment I hear that, red flags go up because there's a good chance they're probably not even born again. 
Because God's called us to be set apart for him. That's what a saint is, one is set apart. And to be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. And, and every believer wants to grow in that love and the grace of Jesus Christ. They want to be like him. In fact, they oftentimes get tired of hearing themselves. They get tired of hitting the wall. A life that seems so unproductive. Now this first group, as I mentioned in, in, in Babylon, they came back. They came back under um, the leadership of Zerubbabel. And there were 50,000 approximately that had come back and Haggai and both Zechariah ministered. This is the group that they ministered to. Now there's something else I want to tell you a little bit about a background in history. Um, the Persians, like the Babylonians, adopted this plan a long time ago. It's a wise policy of incorporating the captured exiles at that time of the society of the nation in which they deported and that they would allow them, again, when they conquered another country, to oftentimes go back. Now, these captives were given the right to rebuild their lives. Despite being exiled to a strange and a foreign land, they were able to go back. This is how they would build the temple. And certainly, I want to call attention to the fact that God's on the throne and God's the one that moves upon kings, whether they're unbelievers or not, and directs them and guides them. And, and everything that is happening in this world today does not surprise God. Well, again, they had the right to secure personal employment when they came back to the land, to hold property and build houses and start businesses. They were to start their lives all over. Now, of course, this policy strengthened the nation of Babylon when they did do that, and Persians both economically and militarily, they, they become stronger nations. But the Persian king Cyrus went one step further. One year after the conquest of Babylon in 538, Cyrus proclaimed that he was the liberator of all people. He allowed any exile who wished to return to his or her homeland to do so, and among those, he released the Jews. Now, it was during this time, again, they go back to the homeland. As I mentioned, there were 50, roughly 50,000 exiles that returned. And again, Cyrus appointed Zerubbabel, the governor over Judah at that point. And he was over the, these returning exiles. And it wasn't long after they had come into the land, and this is important to understand, that they started building the altar, the temple, to make sacrifices to the Lord. You know, there's no forgiveness without a sacrifice. You and I understand that because Jesus Christ died upon the cross. He was that sacrificial lamb that died for you and me. So there was no covering for their sins. So this is something that they wanted to do immediately when they came back in the land. But you know how things go. It wasn't long before there was opposition. And, and soon it rose the enemies arose against the, the Israelites and they were the surrounding tribes were coming against them. And before they knew it, they weren't even building the temple anymore. There were other problems again, but the opposition was very successful in stopping that work for a number of years. Uh, probably about 16 years is what it seems like. But it was later completed in four years, about 516 B.C., now, some things happened during that time when they were, again, the, the opposition came, a persecution come. It became very difficult. It wasn't what they thought. They began to turn into themselves. They begin to forget who God really is and what God had called them and even told them to do. And I want to take you to Matthew just for a second. I know you know this verse. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. See, in the beginning they had started seeking the kingdom, seeking to do those things that were pleasing to God. But pretty soon they were trusting in themselves. Pretty soon they had returned to their homes that you're going to see. And as we begin to look at the book of Haggai, the author Haggai is mentioned nine times in the book. He's the author in fact, Haggai is known only in this book, along with the book of Ezra, two times. So let me show you those two verses there. 
Ezra 5, verse 1 on the screen, and when the prophets, Haggai the prophet, notice he's a prophet, along with Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah, Jerusalem, in the name of God of Israel, who was over them. So we see that he was not only just a, a man that was serving there, he was a prophet. And then in Ezra 6, 14, it says, And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they finished the building according to the command of God of Israel. So it was a command of God and the decree of Cyrus and Darius, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. Now, Zechariah was a, a younger prophet. And in the ministry, he was encouraging also as well to, to rebuild that temple that's very important. Now, Haggai returned from Babylon with the, the remnant under Zerubbabel, and evidently, he lived there in Jerusalem. Now, next we need to ask the question, what, what is the theme and the, and the purpose of this book? Well, Haggai's uh, basic theme is very clear. The remnant. The remnant must get its priorities straight. Now, I'm using that term remnant again. As I mentioned from Cover to cover, you find a remnant. A remnant is, is a small amount. There's only a small amount in every generation that's truly saved. They can be outwardly religious, go about what appears to be God's business, but not have that relationship with God. So what is Haggai? His, his message is really helping them get their priorities straight complete the temple before they could expect a, a blessing of God. And see, they had stopped building. They started building their own things, taking care of their own business, and, and they weren't experiencing the blessing that God had. Again, it's important to understand that God, when God speaks, that we need to be obedient. And because they weren't faithful to what God had already shown them and spoken through the prophets, then they were suffering a discipline, and yet they didn't even realize it. They, they knew the suffering, but they just didn't get it. Because of the spiritual indifference, they failed to respond to, again to God, attempts to get their attention by disciplining, their despondency. Again, they didn't realize the hardships were a result of their selfish choices. And the Lord was disciplining them. I think all of us understand selfish pursuit and choices that we make. In the end, we suffer the consequences. I recently watched a, a movie online called Mully. Uh, it's based in Africa, a man that was born in, a, again, a, a, an area of poverty. One night while he was sleeping, his whole family up and moved away and left him all by himself, probably about nine years old become a beggar for many, many years, and then finally went to a city, and a door opened, and he began to develop a business sense, and he kept getting bigger and bigger, the company, and training people, and doing all kinds of work, and he was like this millionaire person. And then one day, God stopped him, and he decided he would never work for money again. In the end, without telling you the whole story, he was feeding literally thousands and thousands and thousands of kids every day. From teaching them how to weld and build bridges and to build all these things and sending them to college and everything that he, that he did, but he decided he wasn't going to work for money anymore. He decided that he was going to put God first. If you've never seen the movie, I encourage you to see it. it it's, it's a tearjerker. It's real. It's based upon real characters. You see the people in there. All the trials they went through, the family, when he decided he wasn't going to, to work anymore. And wow, they got comfortable and used to all these things. And even a church threw them out, the kids that he had, because some of them were prostitutes when they're young, trying to survive and wanted nothing to do with them. But the story's an incredible story. 
a man who was, became very selfish. In the end, he gave everything away, and he had abundance. And you could see, going through this movie, God had his hand upon his life. Well, when they put their God first, and they seek to do God's will, he always brings the blessing to his people, a blessing of joy, prosperity. Now, I'm not saying God wants you to be rich, but God will provide every single one of your needs. Sometimes he has to let you run out of money before you're really ready to trust him. God knows what it takes. Let me read from, again, some key verses from Haggai chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord, the Lord being Yahweh of hosts, consider your ways. So he's speaking through the prophet. Consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. And I'll explain the details on that later. And and the Lord just had to stop and consider your ways. And I think each one of us need to stop and consider what is our priority in our life? Is God preeminent before all things, before our relationships, before our job, before our family? Is he? God knows. And sometimes we can exalt things and let things be more important and it grieves the very heart of God. Let me read now from Haggai chapter 2. We'll see this next week in verses 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land and I'll shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations and I will fill the house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And the latter glory of the house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord God. A lot of things are going to go around this. So you're going to see next week and see when we're looking at Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 9. It reminds us that this is the key chapter. The key chapter that he wants us to see. Now, when we look again at a survey of Haggai, we notice uh, it's... Second only to Obadiah, first of all, because of its briefness in the Old Testament books. Obadiah, one book, one chapter, and Haggai has two. Why well, Haggai's message is, it's brief, but it's to the point. It's strong. You might even say in your face. And never before, I should say, did anyone ever react to the prophet's message as they did to Haggai's message? It was a work of God. See, there's four distinct messages, four sermons, if you want to call it, that accomplishes this intended outcome, beginning with the completion of the, the latter temple. We find that in chapter 1. That's what we're going to look at tonight. And then next week, we'll look at three messages. First, it'll be next, the glory of the, the latter temple. And that's in verses 1 through 9 in chapter 2. And then in verses 10 to 19, the present blessings in obedience. Simply being obedient to God brings blessings. And then finally, in verses 20 and 23, uh, there's this future blessings, the promise. Just as you and I hold on to a promise. Well, this is really the outline to the book of Haggai, how it's broken down. Well, again, the, the completion of the latter temple, that's what we're going to begin tonight. And again, Jeremiah had said in, in Jeremiah 25, verse 12, that, that again, Israel will be exiled for 70 years. And this is where we started, where they're going to come back into the land. And you can also find it in Daniel chapter 9. Haggai 1 reveals that God had kept his promise and the promise and the prophecy was being fulfilled right before their eyes. Remember, God does not lie and every promise that he's given you will come true in God's perfect timing. That is, if it's from a true prophet, 
than it is the word of God because there's many false prophets in this world, many who claim and exalt themselves to be prophets. You've probably heard them, I've heard them, and the prophecy never comes true. And the prophecy in that kind of false prophet is always to exalt the person and not God, sadly, and you can tell that when they speak. Well, it's the year 520 BC, the Israelites, they're now back in the land in Jerusalem for over a decade. God's restored again, as I mentioned, the people to the, the promised land. Just as they're in the promised land today, but yet they're not experiencing the, the completeness that they will. They haven't been obedient to God completely. There are those that are obedient. God has a remnant there. But what's interesting, and I think that you will appreciate, is they had an opportunity for a fresh start. How would you like to have a fresh start all over? Isn't that wonderful just to start all over if you could just clean this lake? Certainly, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you confess your sins and repent. You can have a fresh start tonight. Well, the setting, look again with me in verse 1 as we go through the first 15 verses. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Another thing I want to call your attention to is the word of the Lord came to the prophet. That's what you need to hear tonight is not the word of Ron, but you need to hear the word of God. I hear a lot of people just talking and talking and talking. What people need to hear is the word of God. The word of God is living and it's active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And it does not come back void. Well, the prophet hears the word of God. And the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel and they're going to speak this word. Now, Darius the first ascended to the throne in Persia in 522, and he appointed Zerubbabel, as I, I mentioned already, to be the king of Judah, the governor that's going to be in control. And this is giving us just the background here. Well, jump with me to verse 2. We see the, the people's excuse for delay. Anyone a pro procrastinator here? Don't hold your hands up make a lot of excuses. When I was in California, it was minana, minana, minana. And there's always a putting off. All of us have been in that place, I believe, from a time to time. But there's no better time than right now to receive the Lord. There's no better time than when God tells us to do something that we should do it. And especially beginning with the spiritual leaders, the leaders in the church, we're to be, again, a, a model. We're to teach God's will. We're to be able to say, as Paul did, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. And again, Haggai and Zechariah could say, follow us as we follow the Lord God, Yahweh, our covenant God. Well, the expression here, it's important to understand, says this people instead of my people. He's not referring to my people in that, that sense. He used to draw attention to really God's displeasure with Israel's spiritual apathy. The Spirit of God would be grieving over the circumstances when every person was doing what was right in their own eyes. And I'll probably leave you with some questions because I don't know all the answers are here tonight because I think it makes application for each one of us maybe where you're at Maybe something you've seen, a family member. The attitude, though, is summed up in the statement, the time has not come. See, Haggai describes a people who had lost their vision and have come to be comfortable with the terms of, of leaving God's work to be undone. It's unimportant. I'll get to it when I get to it. I know he's called me to do it, but... They were to build the temple. And this was very important to build the temple. And sometimes we forget that. And I'm not comparing a temple to a church here, a building, because the church really is the people. 
But God wanted his people to be worshiping him. And he certainly inhabits the praises of the people, but they needed to keep their eyes upon him instead of upon the world. Because as we put, and they put, our eyes on the world, we can be drawn away from the very presence of God, who God is, and we, get, we can also have this spiritual apathy because we're more concerned about what's happening around us and, and pleasing people that are very fickle that we really don't like. It's interesting, though, in the Septuagint, um, and you can get the Septuagint in, in, in English so you can read it easy, uh, it, it uses a common name for God in Haggai, a little different. It's kind of surprising for a lot of people, again, which is the Lord of the armies. And predominantly, this is used in the prophetic books 247 times. He is the head of the, the armies. Frequently used in Haggai 14 times, Zechariah 53 times, Malachi 24 times, and a total of 300 times in the Old Testament. He's a mighty God, an awesome God. And, and, and the battle is really the Lord's. Will we let him fight the battle? The title views God as a, a divine warrior who is in charge of all the armies of heaven. He is all-powerful God. Sometimes we forget that God is all-powerful. The things that are impossible for you and me are possible for God. And we begin to take things into our own hands. But he directs the, the fiery forces of the armies of heaven. And you can find that in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Make a note and look at it later. Why? Because he's sovereign. He's in control of all things. He knows all things, control of all things. He knows the future. He can even help you and me, just as he did to the people of Jerusalem to rebuild the temple when they were discouraged. I imagine every one of us experienced discouragement from time to time. We need encouragement. And of all the people in this world, the church should be encouragers of one another not bringing discouragement. If you want discouragement, turn on the TV, turn on the news. You'll find discouragement. We need to cast our cares upon him who cares for us. Now again, this, this again, I think perhaps they maybe had forgotten who he was. See, they weren't in his presence. They were worshiping and going and meeting and and at times when they would go to Jerusalem at their temple was built, they, they, would, they would sing praises and psalms. And there was this anticipation, expectation they're going to meet with God. But they weren't expecting that, were they? The temple construction was soon started, though, after the edict of, of Cyrus in 532, or 536. excuse me. But because of the opposition of the land, the problems, the discouraged people, they soon quit building with the temple still incomplete according to Ezra 424 this was the setting this was the occasion for again this prophecy that God spoke a word to Haggai and he spoke this word to the people now God already moving remember he's sovereign control he's directing all the events in this world Knowing, again, working with Darius, even though he didn't know at the time, Darius also renewed Cyrus's authorization in Ezra 6, verse 1 through 14, to continue that work, even providing funds for the rebuilding. And the temple project was soon resumed and finally finished, and this was not man. This was the sovereignty of God. It's not even Darius, because God is the one behind the scenes working in every situation. Whether you see him working or not, he is working. He's in control. Notice that the people weren't uh, saying uh, the Lord's house uh, shouldn't be built. They're not saying that. No, no, we'll, we'll get to it later. And he said, well, well, we'll do 
sometime, maybe even soon, but, but not right now. Have you ever said that to your wife? Your wife wants you to do something? I mean, we're procrastinators. If we can put something off, we're going to put it off. And what do we put it off for? What's important, the priority at that time? What is the priorities in your life? Is God first? One of the things I need to do in my own life, I have to have on my desk, I have these bullet lists. These are all the things that need to be done, and I need to move them up and reestablish priorities sometimes as events happen. But always at the top, it needs to be God. And I need not only just to have him at the top, I need to know, God, what is it you want me to do? What is the next step you want me to do? Every time I don't do that, and there's been times I haven't done that, I always kind of like hit the wall. I experience something that I don't want to experience, and, and I have to confess, and I have to repent and get back online. And you probably understand exactly what I'm saying. So this same thing still happens today. There's priorities, and there's procrastination. There's priorities that God has, and there's priorities that you have. And we try to weigh them. But there should only be one main priority, and that is God first. This is important. This is something that that we know. He should be preeminent before all things. We let our wife, we let our kids, we let our job, we let everything get ahead of him. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to go to church. I'm so exhausted. I need to take a vacation. I don't need to go to church. I can worship him when I'm surfing or when I'm doing this. No, God needs quiet time with you, and you need quiet time with him. One of the favorite attacks of the enemy is to to whisper in our ears. We're looking for that small, still voice of the Lord, but sometimes Satan is doing the same thing. Next month, next year, after you buy your house, or develop a career, have a family, then you can really engage yourself in doing what the Lord has called you to do. But it is never the wrong time to do the right thing. If God tells you to do something, you need to do it. If you remember when the kids were young, you would tell your kids, you got to do this. You want it done right then. You would expect it from your own kids, from your own family. Shouldn't our Heavenly Father expect to us when he speaks to us? But he's our Heavenly Father. He's not like us. He's tender. He's loving. He's patient. Sometimes even letting us have her own way to run into the wall. I think you probably remember the stories of Alexander the Great who conquered the world at 33 years old. He was asked by historians who traveled with him to tell them the secret of accomplishing so much at at such a young age. And he said to have responded that the, the secret lay in three words. Do it now. What is it God called you to do now? Well, the one thing he calls us to do is be obedient to him. And what he calls you and me, some of those things are the same things, but some things are very personal, very intimate, because we're all wired a little differently. It's in verse 4 in our text. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while the house why this house lies desolate. Now, the, the panel houses were always a sign of luxury, royal dwellings. They boast of the, the, the cedar, uh, again, panelings in the place. Now, notice why it says, while this house lies desolate, it refers to the temple. They're building their own houses, but God's house is broken down. Which it started 16 years earlier, according to, again, to the book of Ezra. Now, verse 5 continues, says, Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
gosh, how would you like to hear just an audible voice of God? That would be exciting. But what if he said, consider your ways? I start trembling. What is it I'm not doing? I should be doing. I think all of us know that feeling. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to be, become drunk. You put on clothing, but, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put in a purse with holes in it. So he's saying, all the things you're doing, you're doing for yourself, but look, nothing good is coming out of it. You're not experiencing the blessings that I have for you. Now, let me take you back to Leviticus 26, verses 18 and 20 on the screen. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more than your sins. I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron, your earth like bronze. Your strength will be spent uselessly, for your land will not yield the produce and the trees of the land with not a yield of fruit. You know, there's something that I've, I've always observed in the scripture. There's always warning before wrath. There's always warning before discipline. If you took this word, hid it in your heart, I hide it in my heart, it would detour us from so many things that we should not have to go through. Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, two different verses I'm going to give you. Chapter 6, verse 19 says this, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where the moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. That's what they're doing, storing up for themselves. And then again in Matthew 6, Verse 33, that's the, the key verse to the sermon. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, having a right standing, walking in righteousness. And all these things are going to add. God's going to provide every single one of your needs. God's promised. God doesn't lie. Oh, there's a hinge. If you seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, then this is when he does this. Now, his timing is different. There's always a lesson he wants you to learn. See, they were concentrated on building and beautifying their own homes. See, God's blessing was withheld because they no longer put him first. Moses had predicted that this would be the result if the people neglected God. In fact, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 38 through 45. It says you should bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather little, for the locusts will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor the gather of the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for the olives will drop off. You shall have sons and daughters, but they, they will not be yours. They will go into captivity. The cricket shall uh, possess all the trees and the produce of the ground. The alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher, but you will go down lower and lower. And he shall lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He shall be the head and you will be the tail. So all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and statutes which he had commanded. Again, look with me in verse 7 just for a second. We see a repetition here. God's wanting to get our attention. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He wants them to get the point. God doesn't, doesn't enjoy these things of them suffering. He wants them to come to their senses. Go up to the mountains, bring the wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now, this is a confusing verse. People will tend to argue and, about all these things. And now, again, when he's saying, go up to the mountains and bring wood, rebuild the temple, 
Now, the money was given again by the Persians to rebuild the temple. And like Solomon, they went out and, and bought all this, this, again, beautiful cedar from Lebanon as they did before. What happened to it 16 years before this? Did someone take it and sell it for profit? Or did they take it and start building their own homes? Robbing God, again, Malachi will talk about that and address that in a, a very special way. The stones were still usable, but again, the interior woodwork of the, the temple was destroyed. There, there was is no wood. They had to go get more wood. What happened? Again, according to Ezra 3, 7, the Jews purchased the wood from Tyre and Sidon, just as Solomon did, as I mentioned. Now, Haggai is commanded the men to go to the forest, go, go, go get the wood. Because they, they had built these beautiful houses, luxurious houses, and paneled like that of royalty. And the question really is, what happened to that original supply of wood? Did they take it themselves? Someone sell it? This is where people divide over, but I, I have the question, I think... They probably took it. Agreed. Let's use this for a house. We'll build this house later. We'll deal with it later. We can be so selfish, can't we? We don't know for sure, but we sure wonder what happened to the wood. For their paneled houses, when no wood was available, for God's house was in their own house. Look with me in verse 9, though, of our text. You look for much, but behold, it comes little. And when you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each one of you runs to his own home. See, God's desire is that his people would build his house. He, he, he wanted them to have the priority of coming together, uh, worshiping together, having community together, this was important to God, but it wasn't important to them. You know, we, we call ourselves the church, and some say it's, it's coming to church. No, we are the church. And what does the church do? It, it congregates together. It worships together. It fellowships together. It, it enables and helps people when they need help together. God wanted to experience the same thing in the Old Testament. And all of this was to surround God. God is the one that brings us all together. Now, if you remember when they were camping in the wilderness, the tabernacle was in the center, and there were three tribes on one side, three tribes on this side, three and three. They say, if you calculate it perfectly that from heaven, you would see a cross there. But the thing that's important is all the tents face the tabernacle. Every day they got up, went out their tent, they looked at the tabernacle. The sea, again, there's a pillar of fire the smoke. What is God doing? Looking for the moving of God, and that's where we need to begin every day. God wanted them to have a central place of worship. Again, whatever one does, God should always be pleased with it and glorify him. Let me take you to the New Testament just for a moment. In John 8, 29, it says this, and he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him, Jesus speaking. Do we always do the things that's pleasing to the Lord? Well, hopefully more and more we're doing those things. And then John, the gospel, John chapter 12, verses 27 and 28. Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. God wants to exalt you. If you lower yourself, humble yourself, God will exalt you and lift you up. In John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And when we're obedient to the Lord, we will one day be glorified. Now, when you read the book of Romans, chapter 8, that you're saved, you're, you're justified, sanctified, even goes on to say again, glorified. 
God's looking outside eternity. He will finish that work, and you and I are his workmanship. May we just go that easy way, be obedient, and avoid the bumpy roads? Well, again, in that verse it says, runs to his own house. This points to the difference in priorities that God had and the preoccupation with comfort. I think all of us need to search our heart. How, we all like comfort. My house is my kingdom, in a sense. It's my place of escape. And that's not wrong, but it is if I put it ahead of God. It's a place that I can find a quiet time, turn off the phone, and just sit there before God. Again, the people were ignoring the central spiritual concern of their lives. They needed a place to come together, together to meet with him, a place that he would inhabit. Jump down with me again for verse 10. It says, therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, the earth has withheld its produce, and I called for a drought upon the land, on the mountains, on the grain, and on the wa new wine and the oil. And what the grounds of produce and on the men and the cattle and all the labor of the hands. And why was all of this? Again, because their priorities were more important, their occupation, their family, than God's work. Or their jobs, or homes, vacations, leisure. And what's important to God? What's the most important thing to you in this life? Most people believe that is Christians believing. Christians believe that he's coming soon. Well, is the priority to be ready when he comes? Do you hear those words, good and faithful servant? But things aren't going the way they are. It's, 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 it's time to, to take a, a check and search your heart and say, God, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way. Now again, as it's speaking about this, this drought and all this, so let's, let's explain what that means. It, it, first of all, it was an arid climate in this region. And when he talks about the dew, again in verse 10, the dew was very important in August and, and, and for the produce because it kind of kept the things from ripening too quickly so they could get to the harvest in time and help prevent the, the grain from wilting in the heat. The grain, the grapes, the olives were Israel's major crops. The people depended upon it for security while neglecting to worship God. What would happen if they just put God first? Things would certainly be different. You probably know in your own life before you come to be a believer, life's was quite different, but as you began putting him first more and more in your life, things began to be balanced in your life. Look with me in verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, again in Joshua the son Jehoshaphat, the high priest and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord in their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God, and they sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. I like that word, reverence. It's something that the church lacks is a reverence. When you come into his presence, just like Moses, he was standing on holy ground. Sometimes we're more aware of people being around us than the fact that God has chosen to inhabit the praises of his people. Doesn't matter whether it's two or three or 20 or 50 or 500, he's there. Again, Haggai's message is it's simple. It's to the point. When God speaks to us by his word, there's only one acceptable thing to do. That's obedience. To act in obedience. We don't weigh the options. We don't examine the alternatives. No, we don't negotiate. No, we simply hear him speak and we act accordingly. Again in verse 12, the, the fear of the Lord became, uh, they recognized it was the voice of God speaking through Haggai's words. I like that. And I think I want to apply that to ourselves because when you and I are in the community, shouldn't people hear God speaking through you and me? 
He'll give us a word of knowledge. He'll give us a word of wisdom if we're making him first and a priority. And if we're speaking to people we want to see come in the kingdom or people hurting, he'll give us the comforting, encouraging words. And the people will know it's God speaking to them. They don't need to hear you or me. They need to hear God. When they recognize this voice of God and and the words that Haggai spoke, they acted in obedience, they did it promptly, and they just moved forward. They got back to what they were supposed to do or they returned. Rarely did a prophet's message ever have the fact that this quick response did from Haggai's message. Oh, it was probably roughly 16 years it took But then when they heard it, they reacted right away. God had stirred Zerubbabel, Joshua, political, spiritual leaders of the people, as as well as all the people to, to work again on the house of the Lord. Sometimes he just has to stir us up. Isn't that kind of good? I need to be stirred once in a while. How can God stir? God uses sometimes different people in life to stir us up. How you doing? Juan, how you doing, Ed? How you doing, each person? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? Sharing what God's showing you in the scripture that you're excited about, and that will stir people up. Let's go tonight to the prayer meeting. Let's do this together. Sometimes we just need that encouragement, that exhortation. Well, God stirred them up, and then the Lord blessed them again. Verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. What precious words, the the Lord is with you. You know, and I know the Lord will never leave you or forsake you, but, but it's when you put him first that you become so aware that he is with you, it is an encouragement. It's encouragement to press on even when it doesn't make sense. The Lord's here. The battle is the Lord's. I'm kept by his power. And whatever God allows, it's part of his plan. So as a result of their obedience, God's now fulfilling the the promise that he said he would do. But these are gracious words, important words, and we should all be encouragers. God's presence Enabled them to guarantee the success because if God's with us, we can do anything. We can do anything that he calls us to do because he will enable us. Look with me, the final verses, verses 14 and 15. It says this, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year, Darius, the king. So they finished the work. They made a wrong turn for 16 years. God was patient. God was long-suffering. God raised a a man up, Haggai, and he was going to speak through him to the people. Well, God can speak through anyone, anyone here tonight, anyone place you go. In the Old Testament, if you remember, he spoke through a donkey. We just need to listen for the voice of the Lord. And when he speaks, be obedient. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you that it challenges us and at the same time encourages us. Lord, we want to be right in the middle of your will. We want to be obedient to you. We want to hear those words, good and faithful servant. We want to exalt your name. We want to bring glory to you. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we know that we're blessed just knowing you. But Lord, you've gone beyond that. You've blessed us in so many ways we can't even count. 
may we be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar. your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name, creation is a story. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry. your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout We want to thank you for tuning in with us tonight, and we want to pray for, again, those that are listening abroad, those in Pakistan, Bulgaria, Philippines, Israel. Lord, we just pray for all of our brothers and sisters. We pray for those that are going through persecution in many, many countries I didn't even mention, Lord, that, Lord, give them the extra grace they need. May they see you in the middle of their trial, that you're there. You're the one that's sustaining them. That they'll hear those words, good and faithful servant, as they make you first a priority, unwilling to recant um, their belief in you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we know what's going on there. We pray for Ukraine. Lord, we know that these are the the signs of the end times. Lord, we don't know how long, but Lord, help us to make a priority that you are first. As we see these things, we we just don't get comfortable. 
we just go out and we share our faith. Lord, help us to enable us to snatch a few out of the fire before you come for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.